What's going down, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Commander Ad Populum. Together, we are Commander for the people, by the people, for the people. My name is Ryan. This is episode 47. We've got a jam-packed one for you today. Today, we're talking about Legions, of course, the follow-up to the Onslaught set and the second set in the Onslaught block. So it's going to be a good one. And I've decided when there's new mechanics introduced in the set retrospective, I've decided to do a little bit of a summary or synopsis of those mechanics in the technical section. Sometimes I skip over the technical section when I don't have anything that's kind of been on my mind or any recent experience that's driven me towards talking about something mechanical, but I've decided that when we've got something new in the set retro that we are going to look at it in the technical as well. So just to kind of tie the episode together a little bit more and to give people kind of a, a tip of the hat to some of the older mechanics, some of the, the, the underutilized mechanics in Commander if that is the case like it is today so I think it'll be a nice little addition and again just to tie the whole episode together so that's what's going to go down today got a couple stories for the community section but before we get into any of that a little bit of podcast business of course Commander Ad Populum brought to you by the official sponsors FusionGamingOnline.com great place for all of your gaming needs especially at this particular time in the greater community as a whole out there everybody knows the 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 whole COVID-19 coronavirus scare that is going around right now Fusion Games is still shipping they're still very quick I get ship notifications the same day that I order normally so they're still doing their part to take care of all their customers so huge thanks to them and and I very much appreciate working with them on to more people that are making their communities or or the Commander Ad Populum community family a better place. All of the Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash cadpopcast couldn't make the episodes possible without any of you guys. So stay safe, stay healthy, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. And of course, big shout out to Benjamin Weber, newest patron. He signed up a couple weeks ago, but I had a couple episodes in the bank as I'm trying to do, you know, record in bulk and then edit in bulk and then release and give myself, you know, an extra week to do other things. So Ben pledged, big supporter of the show, of all of my content, of my altered art magic card business. So I'm happy that he has joined the family because like I say, you guys do make it all worth it. You make it all possible. But if Patreon isn't correct for you right at this particular time, either your job situation, the economic situation, what have you, I would encourage everybody to just go online these days and start a conversation. Tell me about it or share your magic related story with me. How has it helped you or how is it? How has it made your your life, your family, your group of friends' lives better? And today we're talking about that exact thing in the community section. But just quick before we do, if you did have something like that and you wanted to send it to me, at CADPopCast on Twitter, CADPopCast at gmail.com, or of course the Commander Ad Populum Facebook group, you can message me there. Or if we're friends on Facebook, I welcome anybody to shoot me a friend request. I'm very social on Facebook. You can just shoot, a, shoot me a friend request to Ryan Paneff and I'll probably be friends with you and we can talk directly on there. So let's get into today's community section just after this. So I got contacted the other day by a gentleman on Twitter named Trev Stevens. He's a longtime listener of the show, very active on Twitter, engages with me a ton. So I got him to send me an email outlining his magic situation. And I'm going to get into it just briefly and I'm going to tie it a little bit to what's going on in the greater community right now particularly to the public health situation that we are facing globally. I don't want to get too heavy on that though because everybody's bombarding you with it in from every direction and I don't want to be one more panic inducer fear monger. That's not what I'm trying to do. I want to talk today about support groups. Trev Stevens tells me that years and years ago when he started playing Magic, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. 
at the time or at 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 a younger age he wasn't a hundred percent aware of what that meant with regards to how he had to take care of his body and having diabetes it's not like that just it's not like you take a pill for that and it goes away it's not like you take you know a couple days off work and all of a sudden you don't you're not a diabetic anymore so he's in the email he sent me he's outlining a bunch of the medical issues that have arisen through a lack of self-care, as he puts it, over a prolonged period of time. And long story short, he says that now that he is taking better care of himself, he's found that his relationships have gotten better. His general quality of life is better, not just from a diabetes management and health standpoint, but just from being in a better place. And what he wants to do is get together a group of, he said, like a diabetic support group within the magic community. And that got me thinking, there's plenty of people out there like all of us. And sure, we all listen to magic podcasts. We all play magic. We're all part of this greater magic community. But the idea of getting on a micro scale people together that are very similar to you like Trev's case, type 1 diabetics. You get together, you can support each other while playing magic or through playing magic. Diabetes is a little bit of a tough one to say. You get together and you help each other and you give each other advice and stuff because that is that is a doctor's job. But if you can get together and game with somebody who has gone through or is going through something similar to you and you have some advice or you have some empathy that you can share with these people even just to say I know what you're going through this is what I focused on or this is what got me through it or I just had to buckle down and do xyz thing or I had to listen to my doctor at all costs I had to limit this portion of my diet or I had to switch to this type of lifestyle, right? Just to give each other advice and support in that way is extremely important, especially right now with what's going on with the the public health situation. By and large, w- there's nothing that any of us can do about it other than to support the ones that still have to work, people in the healthcare industry, people in the shipping and receiving grocery industry, Those types of things don't shut down for this. And it's our responsibility if we are shut down to support these people. For example, my wife works for the health authority in the the province that I live in, in Canada. Her particular program has been deemed non-essential for supporting the COVID-19 outbreak. So her program has been shut down, but she's been relocated to you know, a different hospital or a different medical facility to facilitate some of what needs to be done. And just today, the province has limited the number of kids that can be at a particular daycare. So because I work at home, I I thought that it was my responsibility to do the super dad thing, take my kid, have supper ready for my wife. You know, she has a very consistent job from day to day and now she's thrust into something completely different and it's changing every day because she's doing different stuff and that scares her just like somebody who might be a newly diagnosed diabetic that if they found trev's magic diabetes support group they might find comfort in that even if it's talking to a group of people maybe in a forum or a reddit thread or what have you online they can find comfort in that So kind of a magic related example from a listener and a real world example that I'm personally dealing with right now. And I always find it so special, so ironic, so down to earth, so romantic, even that we've got a game that we all play and listen to and consume content about. And it brought us all together. And now I have a random person out in the world emailing me the story of how he wants to help others. And I have a platform that I can share that with other people. So Trev, good on you. Keep fighting the good fight. If you want to be a supportive person, make it happen. Decide to do it. Make it happen. Other people, if there's somebody in your life that you can support through gaming or, you know, just having supper ready, whatever it may be, taking your kid out of daycare. So somebody who, who can't bring their kid to work still has some place to put their kid, right? I've got a friend that's that's a police officer, 
can't just take his kid to work, right? So that friend of mine needs somebody to watch his kid. I would gladly take my kid out of daycare so I could spend time with him so my friend can go and do his work, important work in our community. So that's community section for today. I'd like to thank Trev for sending it in and and helping me kind of make sense of this whole situation. I hope that people can take what I've said today and and do some good. It's not about being scared. It's, It's about calming yourself and weathering the storm and doing the best job you can with the tools, the resources, the education that you have. So that all being said, Let's get into today's technical section. We're going back straight into Magic the Gathering talk just after this. We're talking about legions today in the set retro. So naturally, I want to look at the mechanics that were unveiled in the set legions. Today, we're talking about amplify, because who's ever heard of that? Provoke, because who's ever heard of that? And then double strike, a fairly common or evergreen keyword that is used just as often as it isn't. So let's start with double strike. It's a keyword ability. Everybody kind of knows or kind of everybody knows, whichever qualifier you prefer knows what this is. Double strike is a keyword ability that allows a creature to deal its combat damage twice. So the game essentially makes a double strike combat damage step within the combat damage step essentially something with double strike if it's attacking it deals its damage once then it deals its damage again and because there's an additional double strike combat damage step you can actually like players will receive priority in there and then when you go to regular combat damage step players will receive priority there again and the same is true for a creature with double strike that's blocking So for example, if you have a creature with double strike that says whenever this creature deals damage, of course, it'll deal its damage twice. So you'll get two triggers. The same is not true for first strike where the first strike combat damage step, your creature with first strike will deal its combat damage. It doesn't deal it a second time. So with first strike, you only get one trigger. With double strike, you get two. And interesting little piece of trivia with double strike, it was actually part of the you make the card thing that they used to do. The first you make the card proper being Crucible of Worlds from Fifth Dawn, I believe. Fifth Dawn or Mirrodin, Mirrodin Block. We'll talk about it when we get there. But this was kind of like a, hey, let's give the community some power via voting on the internet for what kind of thing that you want to see. And the double strike mechanic, of course, led to triple strike and last strike in unsets. So it's interesting that we all got some little portion of magic design kind of under our, under our hat as a community. So I just thought it was interesting. Next up, Amplify. And Amplify is a little bit confusing. Essentially, the reminder text is, or, or the... The glossary, if you go to the comprehensive rule book, it'll kind of give you what the reminder text is. And essentially, amplify N, or ampl- N being an integer, like a number, amplify N means as this creature enters the battlefield, put N number, N plus one plus one counters on that creature for each creature type that you reveal from your hand. So generally, back in the day, if you had a beast that had amplify two, When you cast it, you revealed any number of beasts from your hand. The creature types had to match, right? And for each beast you reveal from your hand, you got to put that many plus one plus one counters. So beast with amplify two, and I reveal two beasts. Two times two beasts. My creature would enter the battlefield with four plus one plus one counters. Now that sounds really cool, especially for plus one plus one decks, but... Typically, the Amplify creatures had really big mana costs because the Onslaught, Scourge, Legion's standard environment and limited environment was very tribal focused. So you always had lots of beasts if you were the beast deck, as an example. So I don't think I've ever seen this mechanic actually be used in Commander, but there it is. And if you are playing tribal, there's a a few different tribes from the Onslaught era that had this mechanic. You might want to look at it should probably be noted that it was only ever used in legions. I don't know if that's any indicator of how good the uh, the mechanic is, but it probably has something to do with how good the mechanic is. 
Last up, we've got Provoke, and this mechanic was named from the card that did the same thing, which was Provoke from Stronghold. And essentially, Provoke is when this creature attacks, you can untap target tapped creature and make it block. So these were either things that had some ability that when it got blocked, it did something or something that had a lot of toughness so it wouldn't die or something that had a lot of power so you could just untap something that you wanted dead and, and it would it would die. Whenever this creature attacks, you may have target creature defending player controls untap and block if able. Of note, you can target an untapped creature and it would still block. Also, if a card has multiple instances of provoke, uh, sure, each trigger separately so you can target two different things. If your creature has like provoke, provoke, for example. The same is actually true for amplify. I didn't say that, but if a card has multiple instances of amplify, I don't even know how that would happen, but there it is. So of course, the last mechanic that was carried over from Onslaught was Morph. We talked about Morph in last week's or two weeks ago's set retro. So check out episode, I guess it would have been 45 to hear about Morph. Now, without further ado, let's get straight into Legions. Legions, being the second set in the Onslaught block, was released on the 3rd of February 2003. So this is the winter small set back in the day when it was big little little. And get get this, this is the irony of the Legions set. There's two things that made people say, oh really? Wizards is just after our money. This and it's funny, it's it's become infinitely more true now. But Legions was the first set to be 145 cards instead of 143. And the extra cards they added were at rarities, rare and uncommon, not common. And at the time, that was enough to make some of the players that I remember say, well, they just, they introduced another rare and uncommon. So I have to buy more packs if I want to collect the whole set, because you have to remember there wasn't anywhere that you could buy cards and mass online. So you had to like either trade or buy packs or get boosters or tournament packs. So I just thought it was funny. I remember like th this is eighth grade me or whatever remembers the older players complaining about having to get that one extra rare for their set. And that was enough to kind of tip people over the edge to call this set a cash grab. So I thought that was funny. And when we get to it here, when we're done looking at the cycles, there was another quick thing that was just... It's it's kind of funny that I remember people talking and complaining about this particular thing, but we'll get to it in a minute. The cycles in this set of note, of course, being a tribal set, there was, or and a tribal block, there were gem palm tribal creatures. And those were all some marginal creature, but if you cycled them, because cycling was an onslaught block, they gave you some effect, some spell type effect that was actually good. And the ones of note are, in my mind, are gem palm polluter. That was the zombie one. Of course, it is a 4-3 for black 5. So like a 4-3 for 6, not good. You could cycle it for black black though. And whenever you cycle gem palm polluter, you may have target player lose one life for each zombie on the battlefield. That was really good in zombie decks and it still is today. It's like black black draw a card, put a zombie in my graveyard that I'm going to reanimate in mass later. And you take 6 or 8 or 10 or whatever it is. The other one was the goblin one, Gem Palm Incinerator, a 2-1 for 3, so again, not good, especially by goblin standards, but when you cycled it, you may have it deal X damage target creature, where X is the number of goblins on the battlefield. So that was a removal spell for red 1 that you could just cycle whenever. So that was a cool card. There were also a cycle of invokers, and the only reason I mention this is because they were used as mana sinks. They were some creature that had an activated ability of seven plus a color and they were brought back again in the rise of eldrazi set all those years later like if this is 2003 rise of eldrazi was what 2000 and i don't know nine so whatever it was they brought them back so there's of course one for each color and they were you know zombies or elves or wizards or whatever the tribe was and speaking of bringing back first time since the weather light saga storyline first time since the wrath block or the wrath cycle tempest block we've got slivers again and these came by way of several different cycles there was a cycle of one one commons two two uncommons 
and 3-3 rares. So this is where we got Brood Sliver, Magma Sliver, Toxin Sliver. This is where we got Ward Sliver, that's the protection one. Plated one, that's the, the plus zero, plus one, one. Quick Sliver, the flash one. This is where we got some cool slivers, and, and it was in Legions. It was the first time they've been back since like 1990-whatever, 1997 or 8. So it was five or six years. It's been a hot minute since we've got slivers. So that was the big hype thing then. They brought slivers back. Oh, my God, right? In, in Quest Gamer, you can see the biggest winner of the week is Sliver Queen. She went up the most. Yay. So I remember that. I remember it was a big deal. My friend had a sliver deck and it was like super impossible to beat unless you run all Wrath of God effects. I remember I remember the days. And final cycle, couple couple commander cards in here. This is the Muse cycle. That's right. The first ever printing of Seedborn Muse in Legions. I'm sure the Legion foil is still crazy expensive even though Seedborn Muse has seen a bunch of different prints like in 8th edition and 10th edition and commander products and battle bond and but also graveborn muse that drew you cards and lost you life according to the number of zombies on the battlefield there's windborn muse it's essentially a 2-4 flying version of ghostly prison for f one mana more so that one sees playing commander i know i played that in at least one deck but there's a whole cycle of them and they were first printed in legions last thing before we get to the set proper we've got some pretty prolific creatures in commander history or in magic lore history we first have a chroma angel of wrath not only not only was this a pretty big time standard card but it is a pretty big time character and a big time angel that i think people still play this is a six six flying first strike trample haste protection from black protection from red vigilance angel for white 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 five so you have an, an apocalyptic length shopping list of abilities on this card for eight mana six six cool art i think every version of this card that has received some new art treatment it's been beautiful it's awesome it's cool and of course if you've got the the white angel you need the black minion to complement that or to contrast that against and in legions we got phage the untouchable and this is black 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 three for a four four when phage enters the battlefield if you didn't cast it from your hand you lose the game but if she attacks and hits your opponent they lose the game she also has whenever she deals damage to a creature they that creature is destroyed essentially death touch for players now this was a cool card i remember getting my first phage and just wrecking house with it very nostalgic very cool very challenging to build a commander deck around but people have done it right the the whatever it is the command beacon that gets your commander from your command zone into your hand for you to cast it and then just playing the command beacon from your graveyard because it's a land that's a deck and i think that people like phage the people that like phage like me really like her and of course big shout out to andy on legendary creature podcast because i think he's he's into phage i'll just leave it at that finally last creature this is my favorite from all allegiance mist form ultimus shout out to magus magicus as well on twitter just became a new dad congratulations he was the inspiration for my mist form deck and one of my inspirations as a commander player in general we talked about that a few weeks ago on commander ad populum and misform ultimus is a 3-3 for blue three he's an illusion every creature type and that's it so essentially changeling but not and i just play mono blue everything tribal kind of control kind of voltron and it's just a fun fabulous awesome deck and i love it and if anybody out there has a dark misprinted Griffin Canyon, I need a misprinted Griffin Canyon. It has two layers of black ink on it, so it appears darker than other cards. If you have a dark misprinted Visions Griffin Canyon, I need it. It's the last card I need for my Mistform Ultimus deck. Somebody find it for me because I can't find it myself. I've been looking for years. So that's all I have to say about that. On to the set proper. Lots of tribal. We've got bird clerics, bird wizards, bird soldiers. Those are consistent across white and blue. Of course, clerics are in black as well. A lot of what I see here is like limited morph fodder for the limited environment. I see like a 1-1 one, one Amplify 1. 
soldier for four mana. When was the last time you wanted to pay four mana for your one one and reveal a bunch of cards in your hand, right? Like that's what I was saying. Amplify is not that great. If somebody has ever crafted like a tribal deck that has like Warstorm Surge and can draw their whole deck and reveal all the creatures and have their creature enter the battlefield with like 50 plus one plus one counters and deal 50 to somebody, like get at me, I will do that deck. But I've yet to see something that cool, that creative, that interesting, that uses the mechanic Amplify (laughs) or anything that uses the mechanic Amplify. So I don't know. First up here, we've got Glow Rider. This is a 2-1 cleric for three non-creature spells, cost one more to cast. So this is a little bit of a, a hate bear. It costs three and it's a 2-1, so it's not really a bear, but it does go in those light stacks kind of creature builds. This might go in like a Gaddock Teague build. This might go in some kind of control deck that you still want to get your chip-ins in with, you know, the little creature damage. Might go in kind of a go-wide stacks deck that maybe late game you drop something to just throw the hammer down like a crater hoof or what have you, right? Next up, we've got an Echo Tracer. I think that this is a little bit overlooked when people are doing Blue X wizard decks. This is a wizard 2-2 Two, two for three, it's got morph. When it's turned face up, return target creature to its owner's hand. This is a little bit of a bounce spell. And if we are playing bounce spells ourselves and can redeploy this face down, or if we're playing the morph deck that can just turn this face down, we've got an opportunity to bounce lots of things. Ours, theirs, anybody's, we can maybe reuse our own thing like a snapcaster or bounce a different morph creature and then play it face down again we can bounce their thing that's going to kill us lots of utility there next up riptide director and the riptide were the occupation of wizards that were doing all kinds of experiments they were the ones that originally cloned this the recloned the slivers and kind of messed up all of oteria for everybody but they were wizards and this one is a two three for four you could pay blue blue two tap it, draw a card for each wizard you control. So that same wizard deck that I was just talking about, this might have a place in there because you might be able to pay four, tap it, and draw, you know, a bunch of cards. And I had that deck for a while, like in the old 60 and 4 day, and I had a couple copies of that. It was cool. Void Mage Apprentice goes in that, that morph deck when you turn it face up, counter target spell. So it's three to turn it face down. You get some beats in early game. Later it is blue blue two to turn it face up and counter a spell is it good not really are there better options yeah maybe but that's fine i think the best morph creature in the set and in the block is in this set in Willbender. it's a one two for blue one but we don't care it's blue one to turn it face up after we play it face down when you turn it face up change the target of target spell or ability with a single target so you can just misdirect or swerve something and that was insanely powerful and to this day like things like comet storm those are targeted and if somebody doesn't multi-kick their comet storm you can just point it at somebody else So that was a cool one. Next up, we've got Bane of the Living. So this is a morpher. You turn it face up for black, black X. And that X, when you turn it face up, gives all creatures minus X, minus X until end of turn. So you can set X at whatever kills your opponent's stuff, but not yours. And that's Bane of the Living, a 4-3 for 4. I don't know if that matters on any of the morph creatures because we're obviously putting them in our deck for their morph ability. So, I don't know, black, black, X after you've paid three to potentially one-sided board wipe. I think that's cool. Or one-sided board wipe and then get everything back in your mono black deck. That's probably a cool thing to do. Next up, zombie staple. Three, three for five. Pay black one, sack a creature, search your library for a zombie card and a swamp card, put them into your hand. That, of course, is corpse harvester get them they're good they're great for casual edh they are slow but essentially you can tutor for a creature every turn and never miss a mana drop fuel your cabal coffers because you got to get a swamp and put creatures into your graveyard where you probably want them anyways in a zombie deck and of course now that there's more swamps out there i'm thinking of leech ridden swamp and witch's cottage and stuff you can just go out and find swamps that give you utility So that's a cool one. Next up, speaking of zombie tribal, this is another good one. Noxious Ghoul, a 3-3 for black, black, 3. When it enters the battlefield, 
or another zombie enters the battlefield. All non-zombies get minus one, minus one until end of turn. So again, that mass reanimation zombie tribal deck, you know, with the Living End, Living Death, Twilight's Call, Balthor the Defiled, Patriarch's Bidding, all these cards that we've talked about in the past, when you have all of those in your zombie tribal deck and you reanimate this guy, everybody's going to get their stuff back. But then all non-zombies are going to get like whatever, minus 5, minus 10, minus 10, and all die. So they do turn into single, single-sided single mass reanimation just for us. Sure, your opponents might take advantage of some enter the battlefield effects, but by and large, we don't care because we're going to have an army of zombies and there's a ton of zombie lords, so we can typically get in and and do some damage before they can kind of rebuild, right? So Noxious Ghoul, very cool card. Next up, we've got a Withered Wretch. So this is a zombie cleric and go on either of those tribes. Black, black for a 2-2. This is kind of a hate bear card. You can pay generic mana to remove target card in a graveyard from the game. So... One mana, exile a card. You can do this in response to a reanimate. You can do this in response to, you know, a Eldrazi Titan shuffling their whole graveyard back in. Withered Wretch. And it happens to have a relevant creature type. So here's one that maybe you should see play in goblin decks. Maybe I'm I'm out to lunch. I know my friend in the 60 and 4 day had this in his goblin deck. It's Click Slither. It's a 3-3 insect for red, 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 3. It's got haste, so 3-3 haste or 4 is a fine rate already. It's going to get damage in. But it also has sacrifice a goblin, click slither, gets plus 2, plus 2, and gains trample until end of turn. Key, trample. Sacrifice 10 goblins, make it a 23-23, kill somebody because it gives it trample. That's a cool one. I think it's underplayed. Sacrifice 10 goblins. Fling. That It's just an interesting card. And I, I bought a collection one time for like 150 bucks, and there was just like 20 click slithers in them. So if anybody wants click slithers, let me know. <laughs> they all are just beat to crap played on the sidewalk for 10 years. But uh, I got them. Maybe I'll bring them and give them to all the patrons in Seattle if it's not canceled. That's a thing. All kinds of cool little goblins, just little random, mostly limited fodder, but in Commander where you need, you know, 30, 30 goblins in your deck, there's some cool ones like a Goblin Lookout is a 1-2 two for 2. You can tap and sacrifice a goblin to give all goblins plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. That is a mini, 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 mini overrun. Sacrifice a goblin, give your other goblins plus 2 plus 0. Oh. Let's say you have 10 other goblins that can attack. That's 20 extra power. That is nothing to be scoffed at. That's just an interesting one. Here's one that I wish was not red or Kadena Slinking Sorceress, the morph commander from 2019 Commander Precons. I wish that it had red and it's specifically for Skirk Alarmist. This is a one, two for two with haste and you can tap it. So essentially it's two mana and just do it because it's got haste. Tap it to turn target face down creature you control face up so of course you're skipping the morph cost at end of turn you sacrifice that creature i don't know i thought it was interesting i remember that card beating me yeah probably one time in casual magic when i was 13 i don't know if that's a big deal maybe i just remember it being better than it actually is next up this is a prolific standard card and it's it's an elf and everybody forgets that it's an elf this is collar of the claw it's a 2-2 for green 2 it's got flash, and when Collar of the Claw enters the battlefield, create a 2-2 bear creature token for each non-token creature put into the graveyard from the battlefield this turn. So the flash there is key, right? Because somebody casts a board wipe, that's going to happen. You flash in your Collar of the Claw, and that is for each creature that died. So all four players in the game, if they had a couple creatures die, for three mana, you're going to get, you know, six, eight, ten. 2-2 two, two bears, that's a good one. Of course, there's a ton of powerful elves in this set. Just, again, just like in Onslaught last week, there's Timberwatch Elf was a huge one. Taps to give target creature plus X plus X, where X is the number of elves you control. There's Wirewood Chandler, gives you a mana for each elf you control. There's Wirewood Hive Master. Whenever a non-token elf enters the battlefield, you get a 1-1 insect. So there's some good stuff there, definitely. But I want to focus on a little guy or a big guy, however you want to say it, called Croson Cloud Scraper. 
So Crosa was a forest on Oteria, and its cloud scraper was a 1313. This, for a mini number of years, was the biggest tournament legal card in all of Magic the Gathering. Of course, the only one bigger now is Emrakul the Eon's Torn. I should say the only non-token one, because I know Merit Lage is bigger, and I know that we have World Spine Worm now. But until Emrakul, this was the biggest card in Magic. This was it. It's a 1313 for green, 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 seven. At the beginning of your upkeep, you got to pay green, green, or sacrifice it. And of course, it's got morph, green, green, seven. So if you don't have 10 mana, if you've only got nine, you can make it a 2-2 two, two for three. And then you can turn it face up for one less mana. But instead of dealing two, you're dealing 13. This card would end games. <laughs> Definitely a cool, interesting, unique card. And you know what? Just seeing it, I remember getting getting a copy of it and thinking, cool, I have the biggest creature in Magic. This is so cool, right? So it puts a smile to my face. I don't know if that translates through a microphone or not, but it, uh, it makes me feel good. Final thing I want to just touch on that kind of makes a smile come to my face because I like irony. And I talked about the two extra cards that they added into this set to make that 145 round number that people complained about. And they also printed strictly better versions of cards. And I know creators and people on the internet get destroyed and bombed on for saying strictly better. But I think it's appropriate here in Gem Palm Strider and Stonewood Invoker. These are strictly better versions of Grizzly Bears, Bear Cub, Balduvian Bears, Runeclaw Bear, because they are two twos for green one with elf as a creature type, which arguably just being an elf might make them better, but they also had additional abilities at that power and toughness and mana cost slot. Gem Palm Strider cycled for green, green two, and when you cycled it, all elves get plus two, plus two until end of turn. Not something to be trifled with in that in your elf deck, you might have, you know, six, eight, ten elves paying four to get an extra 20 power and draw a card. That was like a good card in elf decks in standard back in the day. And Stonewood Invoker, kind of the same thing. I know that this saw play in like the multiplayer decks that or like the multiplayer games that I played in when I was younger. But it's a 2-2 for green 1. So just like a grizzly bear, but it was an elf. You could pay green 7 and Stonewood Invoker gets plus 5, plus 5 until end of turn. So just another strict upgrade on a grizzly bear. One might be able to argue now that there's other bear commanders or bears matters cards that, you know, maybe grizzly bears is better or whatever. But at the time, this was something that set players off. They printed a strictly better grizzly bear, the baseline 2-2 creature. So I just thought, I think it's interesting. I think it's ironic that something like that was what set people off where we see so much hyped up power and, and more powerful creatures these days than we did back then, right? So it's just interesting. It's fun. And that's the whole set. I, I hope that everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. I love this set. It was Magic's first and I think only all 100% creature set. I don't think I said that at the top of the set retro, but it only has creatures. No lands, no artifacts, just creatures. And it was it was cool. It was groundbreaking. Nobody knew what the what the limited environment was going to look like with Onslaught and and Legions and if it was going to be aggro, if there was control options just cool, right? And of course, you can head over to fusiongamingonline.com for all of your Legion needs. They're still shipping. They are the official sponsors of Commander Ad Populum. I very much appreciate working with them. And of course, patreon.com slash cadpopcast. We are one patron away from hitting our next big goal of additional content. I will let you guys in on a little secret. I am building up a little bit of a video backlog for the launch of a YouTube channel in the future. It's going to have, you know, some video versions of what I'm currently doing in audio. It's going to have some altered art tutorial content, some additional stuff over and above what I've done in the past. So I'm excited about that. I've got a upcoming build for increased storage space, so I don't have to eliminate any of the old episodes of Commander Ad Populum. So if you do have the means and 
the desire to help the show grow and keep the old episodes available for everybody to listen to and you want to pledge, there's no better time than now because that bill for me is going to be expensive, but it's something that I, of course, am committed to because I don't want to take any episodes down off of the or out of the backlog. I want them all to be available. I want to reference back to them when somebody asks a question or I can point back to them on shows. So again, patreon.com slash cadpopcast helps out a lot, makes it all possible, really. Big thank you to all the patrons there. If you have any content that you'd like me to talk about, shoot me an email, cadpopcast at gmail.com. I'll do my best to kind of connect it to the show or or tell your story. And of course, Cad Popcast on Twitter and the Commander Ad Populum Facebook page, another great way or, or another great place to submit show topics. I'm not very active there, but I do check it. I do do check the notifications there as well. So until next week, everybody, thanks for being here. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay quarantined, and I will see you next Wednesday. Mm-hmm.